Hi, it's Mrs. Schluter. I teach fifth grade, and I'm here to read chapter six of Charlotte's Web, Summer Days. The early summer days on the farm were the happiest and fairest days of the year. Lilacs bloom and made the air sweet and then fade. Apple blossoms come with lilacs, and the bees visit around among the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School end ends and children have time to play and fish for trout in the books. Avery often brought a trout home in his pocket, warm and stiff and ready to fry for supper. Now that school was over, Fern visited the barn, barn almost every day to sit quietly on her stool. The animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calmly at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine and Mr. Zuckerman climbed onto the seat and drove into the field. All morning, you could hear the rattle of the machines as it went round and round while the tall grass fell down behind the cutter bar into long green swatches. Next day, if there were no thunder showers, all hands would help rake and pitch and load and the, um, and the hay would be hauled to the barn in the high hay wagon with Fern and Avery riding on top of the load. Then the hay would be hoisted and sweet and warm into the big loft until the whole barn seemed like a wonderful bed of Timothy and Clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in. And sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and would add it among other things in his pocket. Early summer days are jubilee, uh, jubilee times for birds. In the fields and around the house, in the barns and in the woods, in the swamps, everywhere, love and songs and nests and eggs. From the edge of the woods, the white-throated sparrow, which must come, uh, must come all the way from Boston, calls, oh, Peabody, 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 oh, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. On the apple brow, the Phoebe teeters uh, and wags its tails and says, Phoebe, Phoebe. The song sparrow, who knows how brief and lovely life is, says, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. If you enter the bound, the swallows swoop in front of their nests and scold, cheeky, cheeky, they say. In early summer, there is plenty of things for, children, for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. Dandelion stems are full of milk. Clover heads are loaded with nectar. The refrigerator is full of ice cold drinks. Everywhere you look is life. Even the little ball of spit on the weed stalk, if you poke it apart, has a little green worm inside. And on the underside of a leaf of the potato vine are the bright orange eggs of the potato bugs. It was on a day in early summer that the goose eggs hatched, and it was an important event in the barn cellar. Fern was there sitting on her stool when it happened. Except for the goose herself, Charlotte was the first to know that the goslings had, had at last arrived. The goose knew a day in advance that they were coming. She could hear their weak little voices calling from inside the egg. She knew that they were desperately cramped, positioned inside that shell, and were most anxious to break through and get out. So she sat quite still and talked less than usual. When the first gosling poked its gray-green head through the goose feathers and looked around, Charlotte spied it and made the announcement. I am sure, she said, that every one of us here will be gratified to learn that after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of our friend the goose, she now has something to show for it. The goslings have arrived. May I offer my seer congratulations? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, shouted Wilbur. How many goslings are there? I can only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Charlotte. Seven is a lucky number. Luck had nothing to do with it, said the goose. It was good management and hard work. At this point, Templeton showed his nose through the hiding place under Wilbur's trough. He glanced at Fern, then crept cautiously towards the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him, for, they, for he was not well liked, not trusted. Look, he said with a sharp voice, 
You say you have seven go um, goslings. There were eight eggs. What happened to the other egg? Which didn't it ha Why didn't it hatch? It's a dud, I guess, said the goose. What are you going to do with it? Continued Templeton, with his round, beady eyes fixed on the goose. You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it, o roll it away and add it to that nasty collection of yours. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects around the farm and storing them in his, his home. He saved everything. Certainly, 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 said the gander. You may have the egg, but I'll tell you one thing. Templeton, if I ever catch you poking, oaking, oaking your ugly nose around our goslings, or, um, I will give you the worst pounding a rat ever had. The gander opened his strong wee wings and beat the air to show his power. He was strong and brave, but the truth is, both the goose and the gander were worried about Templeton. And for good reason. A rat has no morals, no conscience, no scruples, no consideration, no decency, no milk of a rodent kindness, no compunctions, no higher feelings, no friendliness, no anything. He would kill a gosling if he could get away with it. The goose knew it, everyone knew it. With her brood bill, her, with her broad bill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg to the, out of the nest and the entire company watched in disgust while the rat rolled it away. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. Imagine wanting a junky old rotten egg, he muttered. A rat is a rat, said Charlotte. She laughed a tinkling little laugh. But my friends, if that ancient egg ever breaks, the brown will be untentable. What does that mean, asked Wilbur. It means nobody will be able to live in here on account of the smell. The rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. I won't break it, snarled Templeton. I know what I'm doing. I handle this stuff all the time. He disappeared into his tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and nudged till, it succe till he succeeded in rolling it into his lair under the trough. That afternoon, when the wind died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm, the gray goose let her seven goslings off of the nest and out into the world. Mr. Zuckerman spied them when he came in with Wilbur's supper. Well, hello there, he said, smiling all over. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven baby geese. Now, isn't that lovely? That's the end of chapter six.